research has too often been done in silos, with great focus on a narrow area of expertise. But through shared knowledge and access to data, wider problems can be solved. From inequality to sustainability. From helping our ageing population to better ways of raising our children. It's that spark of an idea disrupting what we know. By thinking differently, our behaviour will change. This research is already happening. But now there is a new home in Cardiff that brings it together. A place open to the world that celebrates and encourages innovative thinking, collaborative working and sharing ideas. The world's first social science research park. Spark. A spark to change our futures. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Phil Swan. I'm one of the business development managers within the CPD unit at Cardiff University. It's great to have you all joining us this morning. I can see people are still continuing to arrive. So let me just take a few moments to welcome you and introduce you to the 2022 virtual summer school. Uh, since the start of COVID, the COVID pandemic, we've organised two successful years of these summer schools. The idea came about as a way of trying to provide something useful for industry and public and third sector at a time when many face-to-face -face courses and conferences were being cancelled. Needless to say, the first year was a great success, so we repeated again in 2021 and again this year. Um, just while we wait for the last few people to arrive, I'm just going to go through some basic housekeeping with you. Um, the session is going to be recorded. Uh, this means you're able to access the sessions and the previous backlog back catalogue of sessions from previous years uh, using our CPD unit YouTube channel. Um, we're almost at the end of this year's live sessions, but we'll be making all of these available on YouTube. Um, we've been very fortunate to have gained the support from academic colleagues uh, across the university. We've had topics including data science, the power of collaboration, the mysterious world of semiconductors, and the future skills of the fourth industrial revolution, to name a few. Um, if you have any IT issues during the session, so any sound issues, anything of that nature, please just use the chat feature and my, co my colleague Jess or I will do our very best to assist you. Uh, if your Wi-Fi drops out, please just reuse the link for the session um, and we'll re we'll readmit you. Um, Jess and I will be on the sidelines. So you won't interrupt the flow of the session or anything like that. Just, just reuse that link. That's fine. Um, we're going to be doing a question and answers um, at the end of the session. Um, so please make a note of uh, any questions that you have and uh, use the Q&A tab at the very bottom of the Zoom uh, screen to uh, pose those questions or you can use the chat feature. Um, alternatively, at the very end, we will give you the opportunity to um, pose the questions yourself. So if you'd like me to read them out, use the Q&A tab. If you'd like to read them out yourself, please just use the raise your hands tab and uh, Jess will unmute your microphone for you. Um, finally, feedback. So uh, we'll be sending out a questionnaire after the last session tomorrow. Um, and we very much appreciate any feedback that you can give. Uh, we're really keen to keep identifying new sessions that are of interest for future years. Uh, the feedback form only takes a few minutes to fill in and we would very, very much appreciate any feedback that you have. So I think that's enough from me. I'll hand you over to our fantastic speaker we have lined up for you this morning. Uh, thanks very much, Asma. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Esma Khan, and I am Research Associate in British Muslim Studies at the Centre for the Study of Islam at Cardiff University. I'm just going to share my screen now for my PowerPoint presentation. Phil, can I just check, um, uh, can you see my speaker gallery down at the bottom as well? 
Uh, no, I can't. Is it just no, the PowerPoint just, screen? I can just see the PowerPoint screen. Okay, yeah, that's fine. lovely. Thank you. Um, okay, so to um, make a start, welcome to this morning's session on understanding Muslim mental health, uh, developing the skills of frontline public service professionals. Over the last year, I've led a team to develop a course uh, called Understanding Muslim Mental Health. And in this session, I'm going to draw on the experiences of developing the course to outline why it's important for the wide range of practitioners who come across mental health problems in their day-to-day -day work to have better understandings of Muslim experiences of mental health problems. And to give you an opportunity to practice some of the skills that this might entail. So in the session today, I'll begin by outlining some of the reasons why a better understanding of Muslim mental health might be helpful. You'll then be introduced to some of the learning activities from the course to consider and reflect upon if and how this understanding might benefit your work. I'll then finish by telling you a little bit about the Understanding Muslim Mental Health course, which is a free online Future Learn short course. So why do we need better understandings of Muslim mental health? The World Health Organization states that mental health problems are a pressing global concern and a leading cause of premature death and disability. Yet there's a substantial gap between those who need care and those with access to care. For most Muslims, their religious identity shapes how they see the world and their role in it. Islam relates to and organizes all aspects of Muslim life, including health and well-being. The spiritual and moral systems of Islam attach value to spiritual, mental and physical health. Religion can have both positive and negative impacts on mental health. Statistical studies show positive associations between religiosity and mental health. And these associations are higher amongst Muslims living in a majority context than for Christians living in Western contexts. However, almost one third of the 1.5 billion Muslims in the world live as minorities in non-Muslim states. In Britain, data on health outcomes and experiences are most often collected on the basis of ethnicity rather than on religion. This data reveals disparities in health outcomes between different ethnic groups. Visible ethnic minority groups are significantly more likely to have poor health outcomes than white groups. The majority of Muslims belong to visible ethnic minority groups. We need comprehensive and good quality data to identify specific needs and, create, and to create strategies for addressing inequalities. Health data on ethnicity is imperfect in coverage and quality, so these limitations present barriers to understanding health issues among minority groups. Given the limitations of the data that is available, identifying inequalities in relation to religious groups is challenging. It is, however, possible to draw some conclusions in relation to Muslim experiences of health based on this data. And we most often do this by taking religiously homogenous ethnic groups, such as Pakistani and Bangladeshi, who are around 99% Muslim as a proxy for, for the whole Muslim group. The inclusion of a standard question on religion in addition to ethnicity would be most helpful to develop a robust evidence base around Muslim mental health. Muslim mental health is an emerging field of study and one that is currently not well served by data on health and healthcare. Whilst there's evidence for stark disparities in physical and mental health outcomes among ethnic groups in Britain, health data on differences between relig religious groups is not as readily available. But from the data that is available from a small number of academic studies and research projects con conducted by third sector organisations and academics, we, do, we can draw some uh, conclusions. So research by Dr. Ghazala Mir and colleagues at Leeds University shows that Muslims are underrepresented in psychological therapeutic services. Only 2% of those within improving access to psychological therapies or IAP services are Muslim, but Muslims represent 5% of the national population. Furthermore, when Muslims do access services, their rates of improvement are lower. Research shows that Muslim communities face a number of barriers to accessing mental health support. 
Some of these barriers relate to how Muslims understand and experience mental health problems and the support, and the support that is available to them. And other barriers relate to the ways in which Islam, Muslims and Muslim experiences of mental health are understood by the organisations and practitioners who provide support. The evidence, evidence indicates that Muslims in Britain have distinctive experiences of mental health problems and that they face additional barriers to accessing support and have poorer outcomes when they do access support. The religious beliefs that are held by Muslims can influence how they understand mental health problems. And this in turn can influence whether and how they seek support. For example, some Muslims may believe that mental health problems are caused by God as a punishment for their sins. Commonly held misunderstandings around the causes of mental health problems in Muslim communities can lead to stigma and shame, particularly if mental health problems are associated with being non-religious or not religious enough. This can make people reluctant to seek problems, uh, seek support for their mental health problems. Muslims who associate their mental health problems with their religiosity may use prayer as a coping mechanism or seek support from religious figures to address the spiritual matters that they feel are causing the problem instead of seeking formal mental health support. Muslims are more likely to seek, more likely to use religious coping techniques than those of other religious groups and are least likely to seek professional help. Approximately half of all British Muslims are migrants, and most Muslims in Britain live in poor socioeconomic circumstances. Both migration and low socioeconomic status are associated with poor mental health outcomes. Muslims may not seek mental health support or may prefer support from religious practitioners because of deep concerns about modern psychiatry and psychology and their compatibility with Islam. They may also fear discrimination in forms of racism or Islamophobia from non-Muslim practitioners. Re recent research shows that some Muslims feel that current mainstream counselling does not cater for the needs um, of Muslims relating to their faith issues. In a survey conducted by the grassroots mental health organisation, the Lantern Initiative, they found that 88% of Muslim respondents expressed a pre preference for faith-informed counselling. The research that reports these barriers often also presents some possible solutions to them. Some of these suggestions include the promotion of mental health literacy among Muslim communities. They also suggest that mental health education and interventions for Muslims should be developed in collaboration with authoritative and religiously informed figures from Muslim communities. And that service providers might work in partnership with religious institutions such as mosques and directly with Muslim communities to tackle any concerns and suspicions around mainstream, mainstream mental health support provision. Islamic literature and history might also be used to understand mental health in Muslim communities, to tailor health promotion activities and services provided, a recognition of the importance of mental health in, in Islam shared by those with religious authority may help to address issues of stigma and shame. There is also a need um, to tackle racialized or Islamic, Islamophobic stereotypes among non-Muslim mental health practitioners where they exist. Practitioners might also benefit um, by gaining a better understanding um, of Islam as a core aspect of people's identity and their preferred way of coping. They might also find ways to develop greater confidence to explore faith, culture and discrimination when providing support. Religious practitioners such as imams who provide spiritual guidance um, might also benefit from receiving professional training in mental health support provision and the promotion of better mental health care in Muslim communities. On this slide, I've included some of the references um, for some of the evidence and research that I've presented, and I hope uh, my colleagues um, from CPD might be able to share uh, these slides with you so that you can take a closer look at some of that research yourselves. So I'm going to give you um, a little 
a little bit of a, a chance to, to have um, to consider the information that I've shared with you, but also your own experience and knowledge that you bring to the session today. I'd like you to consider what you feel is the most significant challenge that Muslims face in relation to their mental health. We'll give you five minutes to um, have a think um, and then perhaps share your thoughts if you're comfortable to do so in the chat, which I believe um, Jess has uh, enabled for you to be able to share your thoughts there. So take a minute uh, to think about what you think is the most significant challenge and then share your thoughts in the chat. some interesting suggestions coming through there in the chat. Thank you for sharing your thoughts there. Um, Nicole suggests that stigma is the biggest challenge. Um, so I, I wonder whether you feel that um, um, Muslim people with mental health problems um, perhaps um, see, um, is it stigma is a bigger challenge for people from Muslim communities than for others. Um, and Lucy, I can see there that you, yeah, have remarked about the uh, secular nature of assessments that might not enable practitioners to fully explore faith. It's interesting, Elizabeth, that you say that um, Muslim students may not want to burden, burden other, others with their worries. I wonder whether you think that might be religiously informed in any way or not, um, the, the, the kind of hesitance to burden other people with your concerns and issues around trust as well. Thank you, Daniel, for that. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, everyone. We will move on now. There'll be other opportunities um, to share your ideas and reflections as, as we go through the session. That's interesting, Elizabeth, last one, cultural rather than religious. So I take it there you mean perhaps uh, more related to ethnic culture than, than religious beliefs as well. But these are all fascinating observations. Thank you, Elizabeth, um, and everybody for participating. Um, in that brief discussion, but we will move on now. And as I said, there'll be other opportunities to share your ideas in, in, in the chat as well. Okay. 
So Understanding Muslim Mental Health is a free online course that has been developed at the Centre for the Study of Islam um, at Cardiff University in close collaboration with the Learning and Teaching Academy and with support from the CBD unit too. The course is hosted on the FutureLearn platform and the project of developing the course has been generously funded by the Jamil Educational Foundation. In this introductory course, learners will explore Muslim experiences of mental health problems. As they work through the course, they gain a better understanding of Muslims, Islam and mental health and apply this knowledge by reflecting on their own practice to consider ways in which they might improve experiences of and access to mental health support for Muslims. Understanding Muslim mental health has been designed as a form of skills development for the wide range of practitioners who are involved in providing mental health support for Muslim communities. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted widespread inequalities in society and particularly health inequalities. The pandemic also led to and exacerbated mental health problems across wide sections of society. The important and challenging task for health and social care practitioners in providing mental health support was highlighted as they worked and continue to work in constrained working conditions because of the pandemic. Health and social care staff had limited opportunities to participate in CBD activities during the pandemic. Therefore, this course aims to support the skills development of health and social care practitioners in meeting the needs of Muslims who are marginalised in wider society and who are less likely to benefit from mental health support services. This is a free online course which is open to all and hosted on the FutureLearn platform. It requires sign up to FutureLearn, which is a relatively simple and straightforward process and requires five hours a week of learning over four weeks. Develop what we hope is some engaging and informative content, which includes first-hand accounts of people with lived experience of mental health problems, the practitioners who provide mental health support, and national and international experts in the field of Muslim mental health. The focus of the course is on reflection and conversation and the sharing of ideas between the learners using the social learning elements of this online course. We'll try and replicate some of that in this session um, as, we, as, uh, as we work through the activities that, that are planned. FutureLearn offer, uh, I have to say this <laughs> um, as, as a reminder that FutureLearn do offer a number of paid for options, but the content of the course remains the same whether you use the free or the paid for versions. Um, under the free version, the course is available for four weeks to all learners who select the free version. And we expect that everyone should be able to complete the course well within this time. I'm now going to introduce some of the activities that are included in the course. Um, and I ask you to draw on the information introduced at the start of the session and your existing experience and knowledge to complete the activities. And we're going to start off with a Zoom poll that uh, hopefully Jess will be able to put up for us, um, where I ask you to consider the question, can a better understanding of Islam and Muslims among health and social care practitioners lead to better health support for Muslims? And there are three response categories. So we'll give you a minute to consider the question um, and uh, to answer it too. Okay, so we see the results and, and from my experience over the last year, they're not um, entirely surprising. A lot of practitioners that we've spoken to in the development of the course and as learners in the course have agreed 
um, that um, they would appreciate a better understanding of Islam and Muslims. So we can see here from the poll that 77% of you agree that this would um, lead to better mental health support. Um, and some of you uh, remain uncertain um, and have suggested maybe. Um, so thank you for completing the poll. Jess, I think that's done there. Thank you. Thank you. So another part of throughout the course, we have included learning activities, short quizzes and prompts for discussion between the broad range of people who provide mental health support um, in Muslim communities with the aim that through sharing observations, thoughts and reflections, learners will enhance their understanding of Muslim mental health and practice skills in discussing the topic with others. We encourage learners to keep a reflective diary to reflect upon what they've learned and consider how they might use the knowledge gained through completing the course to better understand and discuss with others how being Muslim might impact on mental health. So I've included one of the reflective activities uh, from the course on the slide that you can see in front of you. So I'm gonna give you five minutes now to consider the question that's up on the screen. Um, I ask you to consider your own experiences of providing mental health support. Um, and whether you think that a better understanding of religious practices and beliefs would help you to provide better mental health support for religious and minority groups. Um, you might, um, it might be particularly helpful for you to think of a particular person that you might have worked with um, in, the, in, in the past where this helped because you did it or where it might have helped if you'd had this better understanding. Um, and if you feel comfortable to do so, um, you can share your reflection in the chat. So not just answering the question, but actually if you can think of a practical example of when or if it might have helped. So a couple of minutes to consider the question and an example. And then um, if, if you feel comfortable to do so, please do share your experience and reflection in the chat as well so that other learners can, can, can kind of benefit from, from your experiences.
Great to see some of the reflections being shared um, in the chat. I know it's not always an easy thing to do, think quickly um, and then to share um, your, your, your kind of experiences as well. But it's great to see this. And perhaps uh, if others don't have examples that they can draw upon, they can take a look um, at what's been shared in the chat so far and respond to that and consider how you might feel in that situation, which is the real benefit of this kind of socially engaged form of learning. Reading through these brief summaries, I just want to know more about each of these experiences and what it was that, that you gained um, through working through these very practical examples. You see the shame comes up quite a bit and stigma as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I wonder what how practitioners, you know, deal deal with that um, and, and how they think that a better understanding might be able of, of Islam and Muslims can help to address some of those barriers to seeking mental health support as well. But that's great. And it's great to see you all engaging um, with this reflective activity as well. So thank you all for sharing your reflections. And I hope um, everybody all everybody in the session today can, can take a quick look and see some of the issues, real life issues that practitioners do come across in their work. So to move along um, in today's session, um, to ask you to uh, leave the session for a little while to follow um, the video link um, to an example of uh, content from the course uh, where Dr. Rothman explains how Islamic beliefs can impact on mental health. It's a short five minute video and I will share the link in the chat. Jess, can you help me with that from the link that I shared with you earlier? I'll do the link now. Yeah. So I hope that you can all um, see the link in the chat box now. Um, I ask you to, to go away um, and um, um, watch the video. Um, and then when we come back, we will, um, I'll ask you to share your thoughts um, um, on these, the following two questions. So for the moment, if you all can, you can uh, follow the link and watch the video and we'll return to just discuss some of your, your reflections on, on the content of the video. If you have any problems accessing, please do um, pop that, um, that information to the chat and we'll see if we can give you a hand with accessing the video from there.
Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the video um, and found it informative. Um, I had left a couple of minutes. I hope that you're all back as well um, from watching the video. Um, I, yeah, if if we have um, a couple of minutes to perhaps um, for you to share your reflections on the videos. Um, so this is a question from within the course. Do you have the skills and knowledge to incorporate Islamic beliefs and practicing practices when providing mental health support? This is because on the wider course, um, we, we have designed the course so that Muslim practitioners like imams can also um, learn something um, uh, about providing mental health support from the course. And we understand that mainstream practitioners don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have the skills and knowledge um, but I wonder if you can answer the second question, um, if you're not uh, looking at it from a, a religious practitioner point of view. Do you, do you know who you would consult or work with um, to, to gain some support um, with understanding um, Islamic beliefs and practices? So if you had a particular question to ask, do you know who you would put that to um, and where you would seek um, further information and guidance from? So if you um, can pop um, your reflections on, 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 on your ideas on where you'd find that information um, within your professional field of practice. Um, that might be helpful to other learners um, to get some ideas from, from where they'd go to look for that support. So we have a couple of minutes for that if, um, yeah, if anyone wants to share their ideas or questions. or even just their reflections on the video itself as well, um, what might have been new for you within it, or anything that surprised you. Okay, we're not getting very much back from the chat at the moment, so I will move on. But yeah, if you carry on sharing your thoughts, other le other learners will be able to kind of benefit from your experiences. Um, and it might maybe be the case that people have the same questions that you do. And sometimes it's really reassuring to know that, uh, to know that it's okay to ask the questions as well. Um, and hopefully through this kind of social learning, people can share their ideas and, and share their expertise as well. So just move on a little bit to talk a little, um, tell you a little bit about the course. Um, so the course objective is to provide learners with a contextual understanding of Muslim experiences of mental health problems, particularly in a minority context. Learners are introduced to Islamically inclusive approaches to mental health support and consider practical ways in which they might apply this knowledge to improve the support that they provide. Throughout the course, learners are signposted, signposted to resources for more advanced information on Muslim mental health. What I've done is included, in the interest of keeping to time and leaving some time for Q&A, um, the following couple of slides um, go over the intended audience for the course, um, as well as the learner outcomes. I have included a link to the course page on FutureLearn, so you can take a look at all of this information in your own time. Um, and um, I know that you can Google uh, understanding Muslim mental health quite easily, and, and, and the course page should come up for you to be able to kind of take a look around and see what the course is and who it's meant for. So I will leave it uh, there for now. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, there is absolutely no obligation for, for those attending this session to sign up for the course, but if you do, you will benefit from engaging with a learning community of, of, of more than a thousand, close to 1,500 at the moment registered users. Um, and there's um, it's really pleasing um, to see that learners on the course are kind of sharing their experiences and their reflections on the course materials they go through and learning as much from each other 
um, as they are from the, the course material as well. Um, and so that's really, it's really encouraging to see that kind of engagement because the aim of the course is to create a safe space to start those conversations and discussions. And I hope you've had a small flavor of how that might work in practice for you during this session. But I will um, open the floor now to Q&A. And I think that um, um, Phil and Jess are gonna give a hand with um, um, pointing out some of the questions. You can either put your questions in the Q&A function or share them in the chat and we should be able to pick them out from them. But thank you very much for attending the session. Um, and, and engaging so, uh, so, so reflectively with some of the material that I've presented today. Thanks very much, Asma, that's great. Um, yeah, if, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom or uh, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, alternatively, if you wish to um, ask a question yourself, um, please just use the raise hands feature and, uh, and we'll unmute your mic uh, so you can pose those questions to uh, Asma. It was interesting to see that we've um, we've got people not just uh, based in the UK that we've got these people based internationally as well um, on on the live session and uh, amazing that we're up to fifteen hundred um, people on the um, on the free MOOC as well. That's that's really fantastic. It goes to show there's a huge demand for this um, this kind of uh, knowledge out there. Um, so, oh, I've got a Q and A question come up. Um, so it would be interesting to hear how asthma feels about the Western way of considering mental health. So I don't know if you've got any reflections on that, uh, asthma. I think um, from the literature um, on on kind of decolonization of, of, of across all fields of study, in, including healthcare as well. Um, I think it's, it, I think there's a robust evidence base um, that the, the Western bias um, and the ethnocentric bias, Eurocentric in some cases bias of, 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 of many structures in society, including in healthcare, you know, perhaps, you know, could, could benefit from, um, from a greater engagement and involvement with, with alternative perspectives on health and healthcare. Um, but working, because um, of course, um, and what I've been speaking about today is Muslims in a minority context. Um, so there's no, the, 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 there's, there's, there's no argument against the fact that accessing mainstream mental health support is the most evidence-based form of support. Um, and, and that's most widely available in this country. Um, so I guess um, a way forward um, in terms of improving mental health support for Muslims is for there to be dialogue between those two frameworks, a so Western and an alternative. I mean, in terms of Muslim, um, it would be the Islamic framework. Um, but that's not to say that other religious groups or other spiritual groups of people wouldn't benefit from the same um, kind of approach as well. Um, but all of that entails uh, greater dialogue and conversation, better understanding. Um, but none of the Islamic kind of methodologies that we include in the course, um, such as indigenous Islamic psychotherapy, you know, they, we don't say that they, 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 they have, that they, that they replace mainstream mental health care provision. But what we do say is that um, they are um, enlightening examples for alternative frameworks of understanding. Um, and that through conversation, um, you know, the two frameworks can potentially benefit um, from, from understanding more um, with the ultimate aim of, of providing better uh, and more effective mental health support. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. And if anyone else has any other questions, I just encourage you to um, put those in now. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ask a question, if I may, um, just with a little bit of insider information around um, the production of the um, MOOC um, uh, programme. Um, I know that um, I know that some recording was done um, up and down the country, but I'm not I'm not too sure around, um, you know, who you interviewed and what some of the some of the results were of those interviews. So I'll be really interested to hear a little bit more about those. Um, are those videos that are included within the MOOC? Um, I, I just know that a lot of uh, video was done as part of the production. Um, yeah. so I don't know if you can tell me a little bit more about, about that. 
Yeah, of course. Um, so yes, we had a, a small production team with my colleagues, um, Mark, who's on the call as well today, um, and uh, Andy and Dewey from the Learning and Teaching Academy. Um, and we had a small production team um, and we, we kind of set up around the country with our, with our kit. Um, our aim was to collect um, a diverse range uh, of perspectives on Muslim mental health. Um, some of those perspectives were uh, from Muslim practitioners working within mainstream organizations. So within the NHS and third sector organizations. Um, and they told us about how they incorporate their knowledge of uh, Islam and Muslims into their everyday practice. And those examples are really great because they to kind of highlight the way that people working within the mainstream mental health care support provision um, through a better understanding can actually um, yeah, provide a support uh, that, is an, that is really understanding of people's faith and, and its impacts on mental health. We also um, approached um, international experts in Muslim mental health. So we have Dr. Abdullah Rothman, who is in the video, um, uh, who is an expert on Islamically indigenous psychology, sharing his perspectives. And we really encouraged him to think about how how people can take that kind of quite niche expert information um, and, and use it in their day-to-day -day work in providing mental health support. Um, and all of, co of course, our lead educator, Dr. Asim Youssef, who is both, is a very rare combination of um, a consultant psychiatrist um, and an Islamic scholar as well with a special interest in mental health. So kind of, uh, and, and, and perhaps most importantly of, of all, we, we have, um, people who are happy to share their lived experiences, Muslim people uh, who are happy to share their lived experiences of mental health problems and explain how uh, their religious beliefs um, and practices might have impacted on uh, their experiences of mental health in both positive and negative ways to really bring to life some of the ways in which um, focused attention um, and a little bit better understanding um, of the Muslim experiences um, might might support um, practitioners to, to, to kind of understand uh, Muslim experiences of mental health problems. I think that sounds like a really valuable resource, getting individuals to share their sort of lived experiences. Um, we've got a question um, just come in from Elizabeth. Um, I think from uh, some of the quest uh, comments she's made as well, I think it looks like she works out in the uh, UAE um, in a British school. So um, her question is, Asma, do you find there are a lot of variations um, in the interpretation of Islam and the impact on dealing with mental health, um, seeking help for Muslims originating from different countries. Um, she comments that I've seen some variation between Gulf nationals and Egyptian and Pakistani Muslims, for example. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, um, different interpretations, Any, anyone who, who spends time within Muslim communities communities um, doing any kind of research, including on mental health, will we'll, we'll find that there are, yeah, different interpretations. And, and, and the most important thing is not to see Muslim communities as, 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 as homogenous in any way, uh, and not to make any presumptions about what they might believe. So there are some core practices and, and core beliefs that we include in the course right at the start to say, this is likely going to be part of most Muslims' lives and, and worldviews. But then there are, yeah, there are, there are intricacies as well of how people from different ethnic groups or different countries and even regions of origin might make those interpretations. Um, and it's, no one can expect anyone to know the, the full range of uh, of interpretations and perspectives on any topic. Um, so the most important thing is to ask how this particular, for example, how this particular religious belief impacts might or might impact on your mental health. It may be the case that um, that, that religious beliefs and practices don't impact on on the person's mental health um, at all, and it's completely other issues that that do that. Um, but op being open minded um, and not being afraid to ask questions. Um, but doing so in a way that lets people answer them um, in a way that they feel most comfortable. So one of our lived experience participants, um, Jamila, felt judged uh, by a non-Muslim practitioner uh, because she felt like whenever she, she described something that that practitioner didn't associate with being a good Muslim. Um, she kind of looked at her a little bit differently or was surprised by that. Um, so yes, yeah, to keep in mind different interpretations, it's, it's impossible to know them all and keep them all in your head. Um, 
but yeah to 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 yeah to ask the question as opposed to making assumptions is, is a key theme that runs throughout the, the course as well that's that's great thanks very much asma um i don't think we've got any more questions that have come through um so i think we can probably um sort of draw the, the session to an end so um that was a really brilliant really interesting presentation thank you so much asma and thank you so much to our um attendees as well there's been some really um good engagement um through the chat feature i'm not sure if you are able to see it or whether or not it's just the panelists that can see it but we've had some really interesting um sharing that's been going on uh, partly through the exercises uh that, that asthma run but also just generally some really nice comments and some nice sharing going on so we very much uh, appreciate your participation um, in that um, so thank you very much asthma and thank you to our attendees i think that concludes uh, this uh, this morning's uh, session thank you very much everyone